Hi, I'm Patrick Manning at Black Desert Resort. We are proud sponsors of Beyond the Game. I recognize that wins aren't always measured by points. Scoreboards don't always define champions, but the story this athlete has to tell, it does. This is why Black Desert Golf Course is proud to sponsor Beyond the Game to share this inspiring story with you. Please enjoy. You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your host, Josh Furlong. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I am Josh Furlong, and I'm happy to be back. Uh, I was in Seattle this weekend checking out some uh, Mariners games with my family and we do a baseball tour every every year, so we kind of go to new games, and it was it was nice to get away before uh, football starts up again. But it was also terrible in the sense that uh, I had a fifteen hour drive back, so I'm a little kind of uh, I don't even know how to describe it, like in a, a haze. But you know, it's okay. Sitting in a car for fifteen hours is not ideal. Don't recommend it for anybody unless you love that kind of stuff. I understand there's a lot of people that do that. Um, you're better than I am. I can't do it that long, so. Uh, I'm happy to be back. Sorry this podcast is a little later in the week, um, but we're going to wrap up our uh, schedule of Utah, uh, breaking down their schedule, and uh, this is it, and then it's fall camp. So with that, as I mentioned, uh, next week is fall camp, and I'll get into that in just a second, but let me tell you about our partners, Black Desert, who is helping with the KSL.com Beyond the Game video series. The videos highlight various athletes and give an inside look into their life. Recently, we talked with former Red Rocks gymnast Michaela Skinner about how her dedication and hard work helped her claim a silver medal at the Olympics. You can check out that video and many others on KSL.com. Black Desert is a new resort destination in St. George that features a championship Tom Weiskopf 19-hole golf course that combines a private club fill with destination resort golf amid lava fields and 360-degree vistas. Black Desert is changing entertainment in southern Utah, and they're just beginning. Black Desert, where Remarkable is within reach, home of the Black Desert Championship PGA Tour. All right, uh, so as I mentioned, we have uh, fall camp starting next week. Uh, it starts Monday, so we get an opportunity to actually talk real football. Uh, it still won't be real, real football in the sense that there will be games, but uh, it's better than what we've had this summer where we just get to talk about things on paper. Uh, that's always super fun. And, uh, we obviously had college football 25 that we could talk about. My kids are in the other room, hopefully not being too loud playing that game right now. They've taken all the time. I haven't gotten any, or at least little time with it, but we digress. Anyways, fall camp starts on Monday. We get to talk to the assistant coaches that afternoon. So we'll kind of get a preview of, of what they're looking for, kind of who, uh, they're identifying as as the players to kind of stand out in fall camp as they, they gear up for the season, uh, that kind of stuff. I'm curious to kind of see with Kyle Whittingham's change in his his fall camp schedule uh, what this means, you know, what we'll, we'll get from them and, and kind of how they, they perceive things. So uh, curious to see how that goes. And then Monday night we will get to talk to Kyle Whittingham and then four players on the offensive side of the ball uh, kind of, we'll give you the updates on that, obviously, and uh, I'll, I'll be tweeting all those things and, and give you any of the updates that are, are possible there. So we'll have that. And then Tuesday, it'll be four defensive players. Uh, we'll get more of that on, uh, on that, and, and we'll kind of do that. And that'll be kind of the schedule for the rest of the year in a lot of respects. Uh, Monday and Tuesday is how Utah operates. Uh, so they're going to do that in fall camp as well. In years past, there's been times where they kind of mixed it up and uh, you had uh, different days where you did things. Uh, this is both good and bad because it, it, it kind of s- settles things. It kind of allows things to kind of be done in one one set motion. Um, but in some respects, we don't also get uh, updates from day-to-day things like we used to maybe a few years ago with Kyle Whittingham where he could update us on things. But with that said, there really, there really aren't that many updates in fall camp anymore. Kyle has done a really good job of kind of keeping things consistent year in and year out. Uh, there's not been a lot of turnover uh, so there's not a lot of things to talk about, especially in position groups. Obviously, there's going to be talk about uh, quarterback battles, you know, who's who's backing up Cam Rising. There's going to be some other battles that, that go on, but 
having a daily update of that isn't necessarily going to hurt the coverage. It, it just changes how we do it. I, I'm obviously in fan, a fan of, of more uh, just because I like to be able to talk and see how things change on a day-to-day basis. But uh, this is where we're at, and we'll go from there. But uh, looking forward to it this year. Uh, I think Utah has obviously a good team, and, and we'll see you know, what what happens. But um, I think there's there's going to be a lot of, of focus going into this fall camp and and uh, really just kind of honing in on, on that first game of the season. You know, you don't have – I don't want to call it a distraction, but maybe it is uh, the distraction of a team like Florida as the first game of the year where that becomes the, the full focus and everybody's gearing up for that instead of kind of gearing up for the season. This year it becomes much easier starting with an FCS opponent, and, and we talked about that uh, a few weeks ago and, and when we started the schedule breakdown. But it's a, it's a little different in, in how they're going to approach it, and, and I'm curious to see how that all goes. So. Uh, next week we'll start the podcast talking about actual football or at least, uh, you know, observations of coaches and other, other people of, of from football. We'll try to get some from guests in and, uh, we'll, we'll ramp this podcast up to the point where hopefully we're doing this twice a week again and, uh, we'll see how that goes, but, uh, I'm looking forward to it, getting back into the grind and, and really kind of getting back into football. Uh, with that said, today, Friday, um, there's expect expectations that the House settlement, if anybody has followed this this summer, this is the, the court case uh, that's going on against the NCAA right now that essentially will allow the universities to pay players. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, uh, after Big 12 Media Days, I talked about Mark Harlan, um, kind of his conversation around that and, and how... Uh, he sees this as an opportunity um, and what's going on there. If, if you missed that, you can go back a couple weeks ago to hear the Big 12 episode and uh, the Big 12 Media Days episode, I should clarify. Um, and it has some of the, the breakdown of what Harlan said there. You could also read some of the articles that I wrote about that um, there. But uh, as part of that, Ross Dellinger from Yahoo Sports uh, tweeted earlier this week that uh, – they are adding into the settlement, and this has been talked about, so this isn't new, but it sounds like it's being finalized and everything should be you know, wrapped up today, and maybe it'll happen as I'm, I'm doing this podcast, who knows. Um, but they're going to finalize their scholarship limits. This, what, how, how this works, essentially, football, uh, previously they've always been able to have 85 scholarships every single year. Uh, you know, Coaches have had to manage that. They could have walk-ons and all these other things to kind of they build up their roster to about 105, 110. Some schools go up to 120. Um, it, it's really kind of up to them to some extent. There are some some limits there. Um, but what this will do is this will make it so that football can now get 105 scholarships, um, but that's the cap. You don't have to go to that. You can you can be under that. Uh, teams can do what they, they want, essentially, within reason. Uh, there has to be some Title IX um, you know, things that, that are wrapped into that. But uh, they can go up to as many as 105 scholarships if this gets actually settled the way that it's talked about. Uh, with that said, though, there's expectations that there's not going to be walk-ons. So everybody that is on the football team will have some avenues of scholarship. Now, there is a change. In, in the past, uh, football and basketball were always head count, meaning you know one person, one scholarship. Other sports have always kind of had this, you know, you can split up scholarships and say, we'll give, uh, you know, this person a half a scholarship, we'll give this person a full scholarship. It's called equivalent, equivalency sports. Um, that it, Basically, partial scholarships can be distrib- distributed. That's now going to be universal. So every sport, football, basketball, baseball, softball, volleyball, etc., cetera, um, all of those are going to be distributed in a way where you can create partial scholarships. In football, it'll probably still stick to more of a head count, but I think you're going to see some teams flex that out a little bit to be able to provide more people with scholarship opportunities. So in theory, there could be more than 105 players on the team, but not everybody is getting the full scholarship and they're getting half scholarships, which is just a mess to deal with, and I, I don't even want to deal with that. But um, in some respects, it standardizes it a little bit more and allows for uh, easier reporting just to say, look, if you're on the roster, this is what it is. It's still going to be messy, but it's, it, the, the approach is to try to make sure that everybody is kind of getting paid. They're getting scholarships. Um, so you're going to get a scholarship and then you're going to get money based on whatever the, the university divvies up for you. And there's certain requirements there. I'm not going to get into, but, um, that's how it'll go. 
so that gives gives football more scholarship opportunities. You know, the guys like a Devon Bailey or Karene Reed, um, they now in theory would get scholarships, right? Uh, they did get, the, you know, Karene Reed especially is on scholarship. Devon Bailey was on scholarship by the time he left Utah. Um, but those fringe guys, those guys that, you know, uh, Utah wants to take a chance on, uh, now they get an opportunity to get a scholarship, and maybe that's partial or full. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how Kyle's going to do that, and we can talk about that later when, when we get into this and it's all settled. But uh, curious to see how that goes. Uh, related to that, men's and women's basketball will go to 15. Baseball will go to 34. They were only at 11.7 in the past, and so you're going to have more there. Softball, 25. Volleyball, 18. Uh, the one caveat there is every single one of these people that are on scholarship will be getting paid from the university. So that's going to judge how teams do it. You know, baseball, I can't imagine every school in the country is going to have a full 34 scholarships available for baseball, but maybe uh, I'm curious to see how Utah manages that. Uh, You know, SEC schools will most likely get as high as 34, um, but we'll see. Uh, This is, this is still kind of changing and, and evolving and, um, I'm curious to see, you know, how Mark Harlan handles this with the payment of players and, you know, collectives and everything that go into this. But uh, things are still changing, um, but this won't go into effect until the 2025-26 season. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll find out more as that comes, and, and, and I'll obviously break that down as it, as it happens. But uh, not really much more beyond that at this time. So let's jump into the final two games of the season for Utah. Uh, we've we've talked about all of these games uh, throughout the summer. Uh, you can go back and listen to any of the episodes to kind of listen to what I've talked about. I, look, I'm not getting incredibly deep on these. There's a lot of things that we could cover with these. We could break down more statistical stuff. We could break down schemes. We could do those types of things. I'm trying to give a high-level view without boring you. I'm probably boring you. That's probably it. But uh, I just want to make sure that... Um, you're getting some info on some of these new teams, especially as we gear up for the season and, and, and as we go into this. So your last two games of the season are Iowa State and you also get UCF. So it'll be it'll be interesting. These are two teams that absolutely could compete for a Big 12 championship. Uh, they have different ways of getting there and, and different means. And uh, they're picked kind of in the middle of the conference. And so we'll see where they are. But don't be surprised if either one of these teams has what it takes to to kind of be up there and challenge Utah and some of these other teams, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, et cetera, uh, for, for a Big 12 title. So both teams are more than capable of doing this, uh, and we'll see how it goes. So let's we'll start with Iowa State. Iowa State will be Utah's last game at rice Eccles Stadium this year in the regular season. Uh, that'll take place on November 23rd. There's no time f- uh, for that yet because it's one of those uh, those games that, that will be decided later. Iowa State comes into the year with a seven and six record, six and three in the Big Twelve. Good team last year. Uh, they had some adversity, uh, if you remember right. They had uh, some a scandal inside the state where there was some gambling that that disqualified five of its players, including the starting quarterback, if I remember correctly. Um, and you know they they were kind of forced to kind of pivot really last minute and and were able to to uh, bounce back after a slow start to the season and and really kind of handled things well. Uh, if I remember right, they, they beat Kansas State and at the end of the season, you know, Kansas State was a good team. And, and you know, this is a team that Matt Campbell has done a really good job of, of setting up for success over the last few years. So um, it's, this is a solid team. You know, the last time that Utah played Iowa State was back in 2010. Uh, this was in Ames, Iowa. Uh, if you remember right, Utah won 68-27. to 27. It's the only time that Utah's beat Iowa State, and I think it's five meetings between the two teams. Um, this was Jordan Wynn going off. Uh, it was one of eight uh, games that Utah rolled out to or wins uh, to start the season. Uh, I won't mention what that next game was that, that Utah lost, but um, it, this is this is you know a team that uh, you know it's it, it doesn't have a lot of history with Utah, but the, Utah obviously has a big win as its last one. So. Uh, Iowa State is projected to win seven and a half games this year. They're kind of lumped in with a lot of teams there that are seven and a half. Uh, Vegas really kind of had, I think it was four or five teams uh, in that middle area of seven and a half where, you know, they could be good and and they could or or they could fall behind that. Uh, overall, there though, though they were picked sixth in the conference. So uh, there's that. Offensively, last year, 
Uh, Iowa State was fine. Uh, they were there wasn't anything special about them, but they weren't terrible either in a lot of respects. They were just kind of a mid level team. Um, but given kind of some of that adversity early on, you can kind of see why some of that was a problem. Um, but for the most part, uh, this is a team that that has a good quarterback in in Rocco Becht. Uh, he was a redshirt freshman that got thrown into the mix and and suddenly had to to start the team. And uh, you know he he did well. I mean they they finished fiftieth in passing yards. Um, that's, that's not too bad overall. They were 81st in, in total yards. And so this is a team that, uh, has, has, uh, you know, much to improve on, but they're not, they're not so far removed that this is, this is a tough sell to be able to move up, um, from where they were. So, uh, nothing too terrible there. Defensively, you know, Iowa State gets kind of thrown around as, as the team most comparable to Utah in the big 12, or at least defensively. Um, and, and they're close. Uh, they're not, they're not quite there where Utah is, but, um, this is a team that, that prides itself on defense, right? They, they rank pretty high and not pretty high, but high in, in most of these statistical categories, at least the general ones. Uh, they finished last year, 52nd in total defense. Uh, they've been better over the last few years. Um, but they're, they're not, they're not unbeatable by any means. Uh, there's been tougher defenses that Utah has faced, um, but this is a good team. This is a team that, you know, can come into Rice Cycle Stadium, ruin senior night. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes. This, this being the 11th game in the season, we're going to know a ton about who Iowa State is at that point. We're going to know a ton about who Utah is at that point. Um, and so anything can change based on, on where that's at. You know, those first few games of the season, I think you can kind of project based on preseason and, and talk it out a little bit more as, as kind of this could be this. Um, but at the end of the season, it's anyone's guess, right? Injuries are a factor, um, you know, where a team has gone, momentum, all of those things factor into this. So we'll see what's, what's going on here. You know, is Utah, Iowa State in, in a race for a Big 12 title? Uh, you know, what, what does this game look like? It'll, it'll be interesting, but uh, Utah gets this game at home, and, and they tend to do very well at home. So I, I have to imagine this game uh, trends well for Utah in that regard. But um, we'll see. Uh, in, in terms of changes, Iowa State, they had uh, 22 players go through the, the transfer portal, uh, only brought in seven. Uh, but for the most part, these were impact players that, that they brought in. They didn't really lose a ton of talent that is going to be earth-shattering for the team. Um, this is a team that mostly just kind of upgraded um, they do lose uh, Eli Sanders and Cartavius Norton, two running backs that they were kind of in the mix. Uh, they they went to uh, New Mexico and Charlotte, respectively. Um, but for the most part, there really wasn't a ton of guys that, that left outside of, of graduation or different things that way, and uh, they were able to do well. Uh, they do lose their offensive coordinator, Nathan Stillhaus. Uh, he, was, he was promoted to offensive coordinator last year. Uh, did a good enough job that uh, the NFL came calling, and, and they wanted him to, to go, so he took a job out there. Um, and so uh, Matt Campbell decided to promote another coach. He promoted tight end coach Taylor Mauser. So we'll see we'll see how that goes. Um, obviously, the blueprint was laid to kind of build that, that roster and, and, and build it up and, and kind of grow from there. Um, but it's, it's not always easy to kind of just make that next step, right? Obviously continuity is there. You're going to have the same schemes. Most likely, um, you're going to have kind of similar personnel and, and kind of how things work, but you never know how somebody does until they actually sit in that, that chair and, you know, wear that hat, so to speak, and, and kind of do whatever they need to. So the, the biggest change there probably comes with the offensive coordinator and just knowing what, uh, nuances are going to come there, right? Is, are there going to be differences in scheme and, and how that works? But uh, I can't imagine there to be too much. I, I have to imagine that what you saw last year with Iowa State and maybe even the year before is going to be fairly similar. There, I, I would have to imagine they improve based on more consistency and time in the program. Um, but you know, any anything is possible, and, and we'll see how it goes. So. Uh, as I mentioned, Rocco Becht, uh, he is their quarterback. Uh, he comes in here now as a, as a sophomore after throwing 3,100 yards last year, 23 touchdowns, eight interceptions, completing passes at almost a 63% uh, rate. Pretty good. I mean, it's, it's nothing like, uh, you know, it, it's not video game numbers, but it's not bad either. I mean, this is a quarterback that knows what to do. He knows how to sling the ball. Uh, he's going to be a good quarterback that uh, if he, he can have his, his skills players do well, you know, he's going to have everything at his disposal to do what he needs to. Uh, he's got a running back in Abu Sama. 
Uh, he, you know, he was a freshman last year, led the group with 614 yards, six touchdowns, was their highest graded player on PFF. Um, he comes back, so you've got a nice backfield there. And your wide receiver room, you're bringing back a lot of your, your leading receivers, your top three receivers, actually. Uh, and Jaden Higgins, Jalen Noel, and Benjamin Brommer. He's a tight end. These are all, you know, talented guys that are able to do well. Higgins almost got to 1,000 yards last year, got 983, was the second highest graded player on PFF. Noel got 820. Uh, Brommer, tight end, 352. This is this is a team that has a lot of its pieces coming back and, and should be able to kind of hit the ground running and, and do what they need to. Added a few from the transfer portal, as expected. Um, so that'll kind of be there. But um, it, it really, this is going to come down to, you know, how their offensive line does. Can they improve? What does the offensive coordinator look like uh, in terms of how he actually schemes it and how he calls plays? Um, it's easy to say, you know, consistency sake that he's going to be there, um, but it's a matter of how he calls it. You know, how does he handle the pressure? Wh- what happens there? Um, but I think it's it's going to be interesting there. And, and that, to me, honestly, is the biggest question. This team really is coming back with a lot of talent. So uh, there's not a lot of questions in terms of, like, high-level questions. I'm sure if you got into the, the nitty-gritty and talked position groups and different things that way, sure. Obviously, you need more depth in the running back room, and they added a few, but... Um, those, those types of things, you know, we'll, we'll know more when this game comes around. Uh, but by and large, this is a team that's going to be pretty consistent on offense. So, uh, you got that on defense. You actually have two of the best, two of arguably some of the best, um, safeties in the game, uh, at least the big 12, uh, Jeremiah Cooper and Malik Verdon. Uh, they, they do a great job back there. Uh, they hold opposing quarterbacks to really low NFL ratings, passer ratings, um, they combined for 13 pass breakups, seven interceptions between the two of them. They also have some great corners. Uh, this is a this is a defense that really owns up to its secondary. Uh, they do a good job there. Um, the defensive line remains intact. I mean, this is a team that's pretty consistent uh, all around. There, there's areas where they need to improve, and, and obviously they want to improve. But by and large, this is a team that's probably going to take last year as kind of a setback, if you can call it that, and really project forward into a better season, barring everything going well, right? Things happen. We'll see. But uh, this is an Iowa State team, you know, that's pretty pretty well balanced in, in most respects. Uh, defense is kind of leading the way, but that offense is going to be right there, and I think they're, they're going to make some noise in, in the Big 12. Uh, there's, you know, their schedule breaks up nice for them, and, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but it's, it's a, a schedule that they can win, and, um, if, if they get the right momentum, I mean, coming into Salt Lake city that you know, they could, they could be a dangerous team. So, uh, really looking forward to see what, what they present and, and kind of how that works. But I don't want to say they're a boring team in the sense that, you know, there's not a lot of questions or, or, or things that way, but that's kind of how it is, right? They're, they're going to be a consistent team. They're going to be a team to watch. Um, but as the 11th game of the season, you know, there's just so many things to, to look into that, uh, you know, we'll get more into that as it, as it gets closer, but, um, good team. So we'll kind of leave it at that. Moving on to UCF. Now, if Iowa State is considered kind of more for its defense, UCF is 100% considered for its offense. This, this is a team that uh, they made the move to Power 5 level last year. Uh, they were obviously one of four teams that, that moved to the Big 12. And UCF has always kind of been one of those that is punching above its weight, right? Uh, they, they, ha- they were a Division three team years ago, not, not more recent than not, right? Um, and they continue to find ways to, to kind of punch up and uh, do what they need to to kind of get to uh, the next level. Uh, they had undefeated seasons, you know, and they claimed their own championship. And uh, they've gone through various levels of, of success. Uh, but this is a, a team that is in a recruiting hotbed. Obviously, you're in Florida. You're in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this is a great environment for them. And they've also found a head coach uh, in Gus Malzahn that has had tremendous success. So, you know, you've got a, a, a lot of these things going for them. Um, and it's, it's been great for UCF. I mean, I know they still have to acclimate to a power five now power four level, and that's still going to take time. It's going to till still take time to develop the depth as, as many fans will remember for Utah, Utah was really good at competing for most of these games. And then by the end of the game, the depth kind of showed they didn't have the dogs to be able to, to really stay in there and teams kind of uh, overwhelm them. And, and that's kind of how UCF lost last year. You know, they have, uh, an offense that can rival many teams in this in this country, 
um, but they don't have the sustainability yet, or at least they didn't last year uh, to keep it going. So we'll, it'll be cur- it'll be interesting to see how that that develops and how they can kind of uh, move forward with that. Um, but it's 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 a team that that absolutely could be dangerous. This game comes on Friday, November 29th, Black Friday, uh, in Orlando. It's a 6 p.m. kick on Fox, so this is going to be a fun matchup for Utah. They get a prime uh, viewing window. Uh, if they are in Big 12 title contention, this is a great way to solidify it, or maybe it's been solidified. Who knows? Um, either way, you're on a national stage to be able to kind of do it. That goes both ways. Utah could absolutely lay an egg here and and let UCF kind of uh, dominate and, and do what they need to, or Utah establishes themselves and shows you know why they should be in the Big 12 title game, playoffs, et cetera, whatever that case may be. So many factors go into that, as we've mentioned. Uh, this, this is a challenge just logistically. You, you're coming off of a short week. Uh, you're flying across the country, and you're going to an environment that's going to be hostile, right? Or at least it's expected to be hostile against a really good team that, that can put up numbers. Uh, the week before, you're also going up against a team that's going to be a little bit more physical than maybe some other uh, opponents that, that Utah's going to face. Uh, and so there's there's a chance that injuries could be there, right? You're going to maybe be beat up. And so now all these things factor in where even if on paper Utah looks like a better team against UCF, uh, this becomes a challenge, right? It's a road environment. It's the last game of the season. Are you looking ahead? You know, what's going on? There's so many factors that come into this that that this game becomes such a, a difference. Uh, either way, be a, an intriguing game. Uh, I'll be there. I'm, I'm leaving Thanksgiving afternoon to be able to get there in time. I'm excited for this one. Uh, this is a this is two teams that have never played each other. So uh, there's no history there. This will be the first time uh, UCF also was projected to win seven and a half games this year, so they're kind of in that same mix as Iowa State. They went six and seven last year, three and six in Big 12 play. If not for uh, UCF, really those four teams coming in would have, I think only one win would have come from that group in, in Big 12 play. Um, so it, it, you know, this is, this is a group that is probably doing the best of, of that, those four teams, and, and they are expected to, to be there. Uh, they were projected to finish eighth in in the Big Twelve. I would honestly be surprised if that's where they finish. I think they finish higher. Uh, there's a lot of teams, obviously, and so that that's tough to to play in there. But I have to imagine that Gus Malzahn, who's done a f- tremendous job everywhere he's gone, uh, gets this team higher than that, especially with the offense that they have. But uh, considering depth still is an issue, uh, you kind of have to use that as as the card. So, uh, as I mentioned. Um, this is a team that, that, you know, they finished fifth in the country in rushing. If you know anything about Gus Malzahn, he, he puts an emphasis on rushing. They, he loves a no huddle, hurry up, uh, run the ball, smash it down somebody's throat, um, and do it that way. Team finished with uh, the eighth total best yards on offense last year. Uh, this is a team that knows how to move the ball, and they're going to do well with it. They, you know, they score well, not not super high considering all that, um, but well enough. They finished forty first. Um, still going to be a dangerous team that way in scoring to be able to do it, um, and they've got a lot of assets to do that with. Some of the changes there. Well, first off, the defense. Their defense, you know, has not been anywhere near what they need it to be. Uh, they're not terrible. They have assets, like especially their their passing defense has has been pretty good. Uh, run defense has been atrocious. They were 125th last year out of 133 teams. Uh, linebacker play was inconsistent at best. Uh, the defensive line wasn't getting what they needed to. It was just the whole front six. They they play a three three three. Um, system and it, or no 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 excuse me that's Iowa State uh, the, their defense their front seven excuse me uh, they they just weren't really getting what they needed to and uh, it 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 just didn't work so there's there's been a lot of retooling there uh, trying to figure that out uh, Gus Malzahn actually brought in a new defensive coordinator to try to get that fixed uh, Ted Roof is his name uh, he helped win a national championship with Malzahn at Auburn. Uh, many of the places that he's gone, his team leads the country in run defense, or at least he's ranked in the top. Uh, this is a guy that knows what he's doing, and he's going to put an emphasis on that. So uh, as well as, as UCF has done in the in pass defense, this is a team that's going to focus primarily on its run defense and really kind of owning up that line of scrimmage, the trenches, really getting into that second unit with the linebackers and, and really trying to just control that. So uh, really fascinating to see what will come from that. 
Uh, they went to the transfer portal and got 27 players. They lost 27, but most of that was the attrition and trying to get better. Uh, and I think they did, right? I think there, there's a lot of blue chip guys that they brought in, guys that should make an impact immediately where UCF should be much better or much improved on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but how much? Well, you know, especially in one year with Ted Roof, that it's hard to, to, to know. Um, but there's going to be much more emphasis there. Once again, depth becomes a factor. You can get those top-end guys, and they can be a factor, but if they can't sustain themselves throughout the season, uh, where does that go? You know, does does UCF have, you know, the, the, the depth to be able to compete at that level? We'll see. Beyond that, though, the, the big name that they got out of the transfer portal was K.J. Jefferson, quarterback from Arkansas. If you remember, this is a guy that uh, he did phenomenal at Arkansas. He's a dual-threat quarterback just kind of in a system that really didn't work for him. And so a lot of his talent and skill uh, was kind of negated by just bad offensive line play um, and just an overall system that just didn't help him move forward. Uh, He has tremendous upside, and unfortunately it's going to come in his last season where he's transferring to UCF. Um, But this is is a match made in heaven for Gus Malzahn. Uh, You have a guy that um, he's he's an accurate passer. Last year, even in a down-ish year, he threw 64%. Uh, through 2,100 yards. So not a ton last year, but through 19 touchdowns, eight interceptions, has has some chances for interceptions. But it's a guy that um, he's not a run-first guy. He's a guy that can absolutely you know dish off the ball. He can make his plays, and then if he needs to, he can you know extend the play, run, you know, run the ball and do whatever he needs to. Uh, last year he had 447 yards. The year before, I believe it was 600 something. I didn't put that in my notes. Um, but this is this is a guy that that is absolutely going to be the central point of Malzahn's offense. Malzahn will be calling the plays, and so it's going to be his offense. Uh, and Jefferson is going to be that guy, right, the focal point there. Uh, if you remember, Utah has struggled at times with with uh, dual threat quarterbacks. You know, it, depending on who they are, hasn't always gone well. And the fact that this is a you know, game at the end of the season, if Jefferson is healthy and, and UCF is rolling and, and everything, this could be a challenge. Well, it, 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 it will be a challenge, right? It doesn't matter what situation they're in. This will be a challenge, but uh, you've got, you've got a guy that's going to be able to really help everything that they need to do, especially with what, what UCF is bringing back. They essentially return almost all of their skills players. They, they get their leading rusher, their second leading rusher. They get their second and third leading receivers, and all of them have tremendous stats. You have R.J. Harvey uh, running back. He finished with 1,400 yards last year, 16 touchdowns. He's their leading rusher. He's going to be another focal point to that. The fact that you have Harvey and Jefferson in the backfield, that's going to be dangerous for teams to kind of factor you know, what's going on, if there's play action passes, whatever is going to happen, that becomes a challenge. Um, I'm curious to see what happens, though, with the, the inner, you know, the helmet intercoms and how this works for, for player or teams with no huddle or hurry up, like how that's going to work and how that works with the defense. That This, this game especially, you know, we'll, we'll know a ton by then, um, but this is those types of teams where I'm curious to see how that factors into it as much and, and what happens there, but... Um, you've got those two in the backfield. You add on top of that, Johnny Richardson, he had 573 yards last year, one touchdown. That's another asset that I'm sure will even improve there. Um, you also add in Miles Montgomery, running back from Cincinnati. He was their third leading rusher, 428 yards, three touchdowns. Um, you, you know, they're, they're loaded back there and they're going to be okay. So for a team that, that puts an emphasis on running the ball, uh, they're going to be okay. And you have to imagine that they're going to do well there. Uh, that'll most likely be an emphasis of Utah's defense when they come in there is, is stacking the box and, and trying to make them pay. Um, but with that said, UCF really does a good job also of being able to flex it out and, and get it to its wide receivers. You have Kobe Hudson, second leading receiver last year. He finished with 900 yards. Yes, second leading receiver with 900 yards, had eight touchdowns. He's going to be kind of the focal point there as well as the slot receiver, Xavier Towson. Um, he finished with 325 yards. He also had, I think, the same amount in rushing, three touchdowns, third leading receiver. This is this is a team that's going to be stacked on offense, right? You've got a team that knows what it needs to do. It's able to get the ball out. You decide to own up the run and try to stop them that way. They're going to throw it and, and find, you know, plays that way. You decide to give it to the, you know, 
cover the passing game and they're going to ram it down your throat. This is a team that's going to be tough and uh, really it's just going to be depth that matters for this team. So that'll be how that goes. Offensive line consistency will probably be the biggest question. Uh, they lose three. Uh, they do have three guys that have starter minutes and um, will kind of be factored into there. And so you're finding two other guys. How that how that works, how they gel, that's probably going to be the biggest question on offense. Uh, just really trying to see how that goes. If that doesn't come together well, you know, KJ Jefferson doesn't do as well. You The run game doesn't do as well. I have to imagine it does, though, based on on the run push that they were getting last year. The, the system has been built where that is their focus. Pass protection maybe not as good. Um, but this is this is where maybe everything kind of the, the linchpin, so to speak, of that offense. If they can get good offensive line play, you know, this UCF team, the sky's the limit in a lot of ways. You know, I don't, I don't think they compete for a Big 12 title, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're in the top half of that conference and top quarter even um, competing or, or contending down to the, to the very last game. So uh, it should be a good team that way. Defensively, uh, they lose their two defensive ends. They lose their, their, uh, their linebackers. But in some respects, that's a good thing. They needed more, so it, it's not a huge loss. Uh, they've, they've, like I said, they filled that with blue chip guys. Uh, they also got five more receivers in the portal. Uh, you know, 13 players came in, uh, on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, this is, this is an area where they're focusing in on everything they possibly can. Uh, the, the biggest questions come down to, uh, you know, the offensive line consistency, like I talked about, can they get a better run game defense? Uh, what will the new DC look like, how his scheme works, the system works, will that work? You know, everything's kind of in, in that as well as depth. So really intriguing game to me. Uh, I'm excited to go down to Orlando and, and see this happen. Uh, I, you know, it, it, this, is, this is just one of those games where Utah is not going to be able to take its eye off the ball and, and, and just think that they can coast to a, a Big 12 championship, assuming that they are in that area. Um, but, you know, looking at the schedule, they close out the season in a tough way, right? You, you get you get a lot of uh, tough teams. And, uh, I mean, you, you look at it, and considering you have BYU after your bye week, uh, your second bye week, then Colorado, which, depending on where they're at, could be a tough game. That's an away game. You get Iowa State, which is expected to be a physical battle. And then you go to UCF, which is going to just be an offensive juggernaut that's going to go crazy. This, this becomes a challenge, right? You, you, this, this becomes a tough situation where these last four games of the year could make or break Utah's run to a Big 12 title, a potential playoff run. Um, you know, you can hear me breaking down all these games and, and, and all that, at least at a high level. Um, but this, the, you know, the schedule lays up well for them. It's not like they have to go face Kansas or Kansas State. Um, but there's teams here that absolutely could make it, it tough for Utah. You know, they could come in here and, and everything looks good, but uh, it's 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 not going to be easy by any means. So um, that's that's it for for the schedule breakdown. Um, we've we've gone through this over the last six weeks, seven weeks now, because I had Big Twelve Media Day sprinkled in there, talking about all these teams. At the end of the day, football's back. You know, we're excited to get football back. We're excited to talk about these teams as it gets closer. Um, these were just high level views of of how these teams are made up. You know, what's going on, kind of things to expect. Um, but each week we'll, we'll definitely talk about how these teams uh, are looking going into that. We'll try to bring in, uh, you know, beat writers, give a little bit more of an inside look that way and, and kind of divulge some of that information. Um, and then we'll see what Utah's doing. You know, this is a team that obviously has a lot of expectations surrounding it. Um, and, you know, if they're able to back it up, this schedule isn't too challenging, right? Utah's faced worse. Um, but there are definitely spots here that, that can be challenging for Utah, and it's, it's not going to be easy. So uh, with that said, I look, for, look forward to getting back to this next week and being able to talk about fall camp, and we'll go from there. But if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to know, please hit me up on Twitter, email me, you know, whatever you need to, and uh, we'll continue to do this and, and continue to go through the football season and, and enjoy what we have in front of us. So with that, I'm signing off. Have a great weekend, and we will chat again next week.